This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Tom Keen, along with Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Join us each day for insight from the best in economics, geopolitics, finance, and investment. Subscribe to Bloomberg Surveillance On Demand on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And always on Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App. Live from the city of London, home turf for me, no secret, my favourite city on the planet. And I could say that because we've got a home audience. Good afternoon, good afternoon to you all. A special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance from our Bloomberg Global Credit Forum. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, we couldn't have planned it any better, could we? Yeah, they came to me like six months ago. Julie had her people call me up and Julie said, we got to do this panel. I said, I don't want to do it. And I said, you know, OK, we're going to do this panel, but we need some theatrics. So she said, look, if we can arrange the Fed and the BOE, particularly the BOE, 5-4 decision to blow up the bond market over four 48 hours, we could probably get Zeltner, and that's how this starts. Let's get the two-year, something close to 520, yeah. a 10-year up to maybe 450. Yeah, but the problem is, is that the volatility, as Jim was saying, is all in the two-year, the 10-year, the 30-year. It isn't in the credit market, which is what you would expect, and people have been wondering when will it actually matter for the fact that it's getting more expensive. Yeah, it's real sophisticated. Uh, yield up, price down. Price down means assets are challenged. I don't care what flavor you have here of, of, of the ice cream of the fixed income market. The answer is coming out of this, dare I say what BOJ does tomorrow, we've got moonshots in certain series. And what I'm focused on more, and I'll, this is my first question to Jim, is going to be the 10-year real yield. We're all living this right now. And I think slowly over the last couple of months, and then quickly internalizing that high for longer message across various central banks, but particularly the Federal Reserve, we're internalizing that increasingly, Tom. We're seeing it in the Treasury market. Risk assets really resilient in the face of all of this. You're yes, talking about real until, yields, real and nominal. Yeah near cycle highs and risk assets just pretty steady still. There's no question about that in the last 18 months, but I'm going to go to the memory of Jim Curry out the door at Goldman Sachs and uh, Jim Curry and hydrocarbons there. He said, look, the real yield changes. It affects everything in the real economy, including all the investments of Apollo, really everything out there. There's no question. Jeff Curry's not in the audience Jeff, he is this not afternoon. Here. Excuse okay. me, Jeff Good. Curry. Excuse Jeff me. Curry. It's yeah. late Jeff. in the day. I did it's an all nighter last on. night. We're only three minutes into this. <laughs> There's plenty of time for more. <laughs> Do you want to bring in the guest? I'll bring in the guest right now. This is fun, and it's really fun given where the markets are. He played lacrosse at Duke University, and I went back, and I looked at the first day that Jim walked into Apollo, and the real yield's about back to where we were in 2006. We've come full circle. First of all, what was the first day like at Apollo, and what does it mean that the real yield, the 10-year real yield, is now back to where it was in 06, 07? Well, first of all, thanks for uh, inviting me today. I'm excited to, uh, to be part of this great uh, road trip. Um, you know, taking you back on, down memory lane, Apollo was a much smaller business back then. Uh, we were probably $20 billion in assets. We're mm -hmm. 650 today. Uh, the role of banks uh, was much, much different. Uh, there was a massive risk appetite at that time in the world. Uh, but certainly, if you go back, I think the world was very different. And I guess I would start out today saying, as you guys talk about you know, where real rates are, basically what you're really saying is the cost of capital has gone through a massive reversal. And so all the activity going on in the last 18 months between all the central banks of the globe, that was the mechanics of getting to this destination. But now we have the, the, the rebounds, the, the, we got out of balance. Uh, for 10 years, mm -hmm. debt was priced way too cheap and you were forced to go into equities and basically debt subsidize a massive amount of equity returns. And so the last 18 months, you know, the world now has about 300 trillion in debt on 100 trillion a global economy. Those numbers are up basically doubled in the last 10 right. years. And when you go from zero to basically four or 5%, that's 10 trillion of borrowing costs that have to be absorbed. And so there's a massive balance going on between debt versus equity right. and versus balance sheets. So, yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, folks, we're going to turn this into a two-hour seminar, given where the markets are. We're, we're arguing about that. I'm not sure they want this to become a two-hour right seminar. Now, the, the, well, the, the answer is I'm going to let Lisa and, and John do the heavy lifting here. I got one more question, which is the memory of 1998, which was about leverage in the system. It was about shadows in the system. Now that we're back here and with the first and second derivatives of how we got back here, where are the shadows now? 
Well, certainly, the, 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 wherever there's an asset liability mismatch, uh, SVB was a perfect example of that. It, people talk about regulation. It was just a simple, not how you operate a, a financial services business. Where, where, where are there uh, ALM mis mismatches? You know, certainly, I don't think it's in the world of private credit. I think it's probably a, a lot of consumer finance challenges around the globe right now. You've got way too much public debt right now. There's challenges. So there will no doubt be challenges over the next 24 to 48 months as you've got fund companies that have funded uh, debt-laden balance sheets of companies that have funded growth capex, and they cannot pay the piper right now. Everything you said in your opening remarks is what Lisa wrote about for the best part of a decade, right? Complaining about the previous regime. We're all trying to figure out if this is truly a new regime or just a moment in time that we move away from pretty quickly. Can we live with where real rates are right now? Can we live with that? Well, I, I think that, that, that it's sort of reality. We're, we're getting back. We talk, we, you say real rates. I, I say cost of capital. Um, it's cost of capital for everything we do. If you think of the last 10 or 15 years, the growth of technology companies, the growth of biotech, there's some great companies out there, but they were funded with the equity had all the benefit and the, and the, and the zero cost of debt is not really sustainable. So this is the real world right now. Real rates are going to be higher. The cost of capital as we go back to this balance. And I, I don't think it's a surprise this week, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the, the FT op-ed by the two finance ministers of uh, uh, France and Germany talking about the European financial services sector and the role of banks. So there's a, there's a parallel path here conversation about how companies finance, uh, how they have access to capital, uh, the role of savings and securitization. So it really is all tied together. Although, are we really living with rates where they are? I mean, we take a look at these average rates, we, we, we see them in the numbers, but that's not what anyone's actually paying. Companies have already termed out their debt. So are we living with it, or are we going to see what it looks like to live I, with it in a year? I, I think we're not seeing it. So uh, to, to highlight that comment, um, the, the mechanism, the transition mechanism, which the Fed would like to see in slowing down the economy, which we all expected, it's taken a lot longer. Uh, in the U.S., you have a, a mortgage market with 30-year mortgages at a 3% interest rate. You have the high-yield market with a 6% coupon and an 8-year duration. So the real impact of higher costs around the globe in the U.S. and Western Europe, it's not been felt yet. And so when people say, well, we're going to have a soft landing, I'm skeptical. I see a world where financial conditions have gotten tighter, and it's just a question of how long that transition mechanism, which will probably be longer than it's taken in the past. There are a couple of different ways for us to get to something other than a soft landing. There's the crash, and then rates going back down, and then there's something where it's just sort of a stagflation light or a stagflation proper, where rates remain high for a very long time and growth just slows mm -hmm. substantially. It seems like the market is leaning into the latter. How much does that change your perception of what's going to happen in the credit space? Well, th this conversation is going into one where we need to get Torsten here, because he's the economist at Apollo, not right. me. But um, certainly what you're talking about is an environment where growth is more challenged and with you know, how do companies access capital with a new price of marketplace. Certainly you have challenge, whether it's in Germany or in the UK, with a, a, a slowing economic growth. But there's a variety of, of uh, aspects that we would see. Uh, you know, unemployment, while, while uh, still very low, it's going in probably a, a, a more challenging direction. Delinquencies are going up. Defaults are going up a little bit in the leveraged loan market, in the high yield market, recoveries are lower. So there's a lot of points that would say to you that there's going to be a more challenging, tightening financial conditions. But certainly for us, uh, the U.S. has been quite strong. The U.K., there's still a lot of areas to, to lend. There is on, on Western Europe as well. So I do, I guess the, the, the theme that I would take away from this is that we're, we're going from a decade of a, a real imbalance where the equity was the big beneficiary, debt paid a crazy price. That's, that balance has been completely uh, changed 180 degrees. And now, how do companies navigate? How does the financial services, how do banks, how do alternative asset managers, how do we all balance and navigate this marketplace ahead of us? Is this the return of the bond vigilantes then? Well, I do think when people talk about you know, when the central banks are going to actually lower rates, 
I think it will happen well before they actually get around to it, just like it happened on the upside in terms of rates. Uh, there's no doubt that one of the challenges of the last 15 years of the regulatory environment is you've had so much capital withdrawn from these marketplaces in terms of uh, trading desk capital. So the amount of capital of to trade 100 or a $1 billion of 10-year treasuries right now, that has a greater impact. So there's no doubt that any kind of activity in the secondary markets will have a pronounced uh, impact. Um, and that's, that's, just the, that's just the way of the regulatory uh, impact post-GFC. Uh, but for us, I mean, if you're in my seat at Apollo, there's been four trends since I got in the business. There's been massive technology improvement. There's been massive globalization. There's been massive deregulation. And the fourth, there's been a decline of interest rates. Other than technology, you're probably having those tailwinds be massive headwinds as an investor now. So how do you navigate that? How do you organize yourself? But I do think yeah. in terms of investors, it's a time to be a debt. A the a technology debt change is the Bloomberg terminal. In case you didn't Everyone needs know. a Bloomberg yeah, terminal. Everybody is that the pitch? We don't. Yeah, that's, that's the pitch. <laughs> okay, we're done. So Earlier we're in the <laughs> conversation, Jim mentioned that joint op-ed that was in the Financial Times. The headline, for those of you that didn't read it, we must close the EU capital markets gap. Can you talk to me about how Europe goes about doing that? Because me, Tom, Lisa, this whole audience has heard that a million times in the last yeah. 10 years. How do we close that gap? Well, I think, let's talk about how we got here. We got here post-GFC where uh, a lot of tools that have been used to push risk out of the banking system uh, that I think have been successful in, in some regions of the globe, uh, the European uh, regulators took a different view. They took a dim view of securitizations. I would argue that if you look at securitized product, that's actually been very good for the banking system in aggregate. It's pushed risk out to the real owners of risk. Um, if you look at other things that they talk about, about shareholder activism, um, but I, I do think there's got to be a, uh, an embracing of these types of tools uh, to allow mm -hmm. uh, you know, greater activity because right. I think it's creating a bit of financial services stagnation. Torsten Slack called me up one day and he said, you know, you really ought to look at the Austrian piece. So I loaded the boat on the 97-year oh, Austrian okay. bond. That really has worked out well. I'm down like 70% or whatever. Tell me about what duration is going to do and choice of duration is going to do, given this new environment back to 06, 07, 08. You know, I, I, again, when I think about the world, I think about long duration. But we, what, we do at, what we do at Apollo is we're really trying to figure out places where we're not taking credit risk or duration risk. I'm just creating great spread. So whether it's fixed income replacement, I, I certainly believe that the world has been on that textbook of if you want to <clears throat> make money in fixed income, you've got to right. do duration. I, I think that's it's an interesting way to look at the world. I think you're getting paid right now on risk-free rates to some degree, whether they go a little bit higher or wider. I certainly know for us at Apollo, for us, whether it's in the investment grade world, public and private, whether it's in private capital, when we can make high single digits, 10 percent, being a lender, that's a great business. Do you hedge into that? I mean, we do. We're, 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 we, our, our business, if we are, most of our business is unlevered, but if we do have any kind of leverage in our business, we match ALM, complete asset liability matching mm -hmm. all the way through. So what's better for you now, right? Private or, or public? You said that private is sort of immune, and yet a lot of people think it's just not traded, so you can't see some of the carnage sure, that you see sure. in some of the IPOs of ARM sure. and, uh, and, and Instacart. So what's your view there? Well, I think certainly the, if you look at an aggregate, it's hard to make money in the public markets and is an aggregate statement, equity and debt. Certainly with, with the valuations where they've backed out in terms of where rates are right now, a risk-free rate, yes, there's some opportunities in the investment grade world. But if you look at high yield indexes and leverage loan indexes, they're arguably rich. They're rich for a lot of technical reasons. And so our ability, again, when we talk about private credit, most people you talked about earlier, they talk about really the sponsor finance market. Right. The reality is, whether it's inventory finance, trade finance, solar finance, there's a massive 30 to $40 trillion uh, opportunity in terms of the, the, the TAM. So that's where we're spending most of our time, creating great, safe spread yield, uh, really on investment-grade companies. This sounds like a bank. 
Well, I would say is we are a, a credit lender. We provide credit, and we do it in a manner where we're not using a, a, a balance sheet that we can lose deposits tomorrow. We have long-tail liabilities, and we match those. A lot of people have said, particularly in the banking sector, they're going after their lunch, and that they have to follow pretty significant regulations, and you don't have to, and you have yeah. fixed capital. Yeah. And it's kind of what it sounds like in terms of the size and the scope that yeah. you need to achieve. It's kind of taking on a lot of the functions that banks used to fulfill. Is that the business model right now? Well, I think our business model, so if you look at our $650 billion today, $350 billion come from, comes from uh, retirement services balance sheets, fixed annuities. The other half is the GP model. We're able to lend money to Air France, to Venovia, the big German real estate companies. We can do that in a manner where we are solving the company's problems, and many times we're doing it in conjunction with a advisor or a bank. Uh, there's a narrative out there that we win, the banks lose, or vice versa. The reality is we are doing more in collaboration than we've ever done before. We have a big venture with BNP and Inventory Finance. They've got an amazing franchise. We partner with them so they can manage their capital in a more efficient way. But the reality is um, there's more collaboration. Um, and people say, are you frenemies? Are you opponents? Are you competitors? It's all the above. We work very closely with them, and they work closely with us. Should we make some news? There was a headline yesterday, Apollo looking to raise about $2.5 to lend in private markets, according to people with knowledge of the matter. We're talking to someone with knowledge of the matter, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking to raise about $2.5 billion to lend to private markets? You know, we're, we're, we're an active player in uh, the extension of senior loans to sponsors. We're active in many of these businesses. We've got a $425 billion credit business. Um, the fact is, we built this business not expecting real yields and absolute yields to beat these levels. We thought it was going to be lower for longer. We created all these origination platforms. So the reality is today, investors around the globe are clamoring and they're saying, wait, on a risk-adjusted basis, we can do this in the credit markets or in the debt markets. Why do we need to take that equity risk? And I think that's why you're seeing a preponderance of conversations uh, about from sovereign funds to foundations to pensions around the globe saying we can make what we had to take equity risk in the past, we can do it on the debt side of the balance sheet. I think that's a yes. Was that a yes? Was that a yes? <laughs> yeah, I think yes. so, yeah. yeah. You are looking to raise $2.5 billion. We're, we're raising the, we, 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 have a, we have a large platform. We're one, of the, we're one of the handful of great players in the world. We're raising wait, wait, How does that work? Do you make like six phone calls? I mean, you, you know, know I, I travel quite a bit. If you, if you ask my family, I travel a little bit more than those six phone calls. But, uh, you know, we, we have several thousand LPs around the globe, and uh, my, my schedule could be packed up uh, going to visit I them. I can see Apollo 70s. PR right now. Jim, you were not meant to say yes. Just keep talking. <laughs> Don't answer the question. There you Jim, go. let's go back to spring. Spring was really messy. Banks failed in America. Yeah. And I remember sitting there, and we had guests come on the program with us on Bloomberg Surveillance, and lots of guests said, we've started a process here. It's the end of the cycle. There's going to be a hard landing. It's only several months ago. What yeah. was that? I think it was a expectation of what was happening at that moment was going to happen uh, completely. And the reality is this is a big, broad global economy. Uh, the consumer plays a massive role in it. Back to my comment earlier about 3% mortgages on 30 years. The U.S. consumer really has not. We may have taken rates up. But the real impact of this higher cost, the second, the third derivative, it's early still. Um, yeah. It's really early. And I think that's the difference between, you know, there is no doubt the health of the U.S. consumer is what's allowed us to extend the economic cycle. But I don't think, I think they're eating through some of their savings. Um, and there's no doubt that there's a more, that the tightening of financial conditions is going to be out there. And, you know, we're finding more right. companies coming to us trying to solve their financing needs going forward. There are other firms challenged because they decided they were going to go off and do something different, new, original, and they're selling things for a haircut. You're probably involved in those transactions. How do you avoid worse practices? You guys have grown this thing from next to nothing. Mm -hmm. The private world is in right now. You're doing a brain drain. You're taking all the smart guys from Wall Street over to Apollo. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows the ballet. Mm -hmm. How do you avoid the worst practices we observe every day on the show mm -hmm. where things blow up from mm -hmm. Wall Street? Well, the biggest accident you can do as you grow is to uh, offer people liquidity on illiquid assets. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's a surprise. We don't, we're not in the business of offering daily liquidity in any of our products. 
We run our products, we really match the assets to the liabilities. And again, I think that's really a core to how we run our business. The second is, we've, for the last six, seven years, we've continued to go senior, senior, senior in the capital structure. Mm -hmm. We're doing more investment grade companies, we're doing larger companies. Witness what we've done with, um, as I mentioned earlier, Air France or AT&T or Venovia, big quality companies. So um, also when we underwrite something, for the most part, we bring in partners. We want others to take a look at what we've done. We're really good at underwriting credit risk. We brought a lot of that credit oversight that is so valuable at many of the financial institutions. But we have to make sure we're really measured and we focus on the three businesses that we're in right now. Jim, what are you doing with the books that you already hold of debt and equity that is valued much lower? Yeah. I mean, it's one thing to talk about future lending opportunities. Sure. What about the ones you already sure. did? Well, let's talk about our business. So today of the $600 billion, uh, equity is around a sixth of our business, about $100 billion. Uh, we've been very, very clear in our private equity business in our, our, our flagship vehicles to fund more so with fixed rate debt and really extend those maturities. Uh, for the most part, we have been really not levering to the max. If you could lever companies five, six times, we typically lent, lent, uh, bar, lent, uh, bar, borrowed about three to four times. So we, were, we, didn't, we didn't borrow as much, and we did it for term at fixed rates. That's a really important. That what we learned in 08, 09, it wasn't we were the smartest guys in the room, is that we had the best capital. And if you had the best capital and didn't get pulled away from the table, that's usually a critical aspect of success. That takes us to our final question to wrap things up with you, Jim. In a world of high uncertainty and low confidence, do you have a high conviction call looking out in this market right now? Well, I think that you have to assume. I, I think there's going to be what we call some, some big fat pitches out there. Um, the reorganizing and the restructuring and the refinancing of the entire CRE universe. You have to be marshalling resources around that. Um, you have to make sure that if you are lending capital today, you're doing so on senior basis with a tremendous amount of equity underneath you. So for us, I mean, certainly we're, we're in three businesses. We've been very, very disciplined about what we've done. We have had a lot of human capital. It's been amazing for our company to, to pivot and grow. But really to make sure that we stay true to our alignment, our uh, risk-adjusted returns, and making sure that purchase price does matter. We are very focused on the creation value of our businesses. Man, you lost last night. Is that what happened against Is that Bayern an Munich? opportunity? Is that yeah. an opportunity, what, to go to the Glazers? And yeah, they ask lost to the, the Harry Canes. So. You really are trying to make some news. Yeah, I'm trying to make some do, news. Do you want to buy a football yeah. club? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we, are, we have an active, we, we have, you know, we have an active lending business, and we've done a variety of things in the world of sports entertainment. But are on uh, script. We, 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 we really are. That's a no this time. I think that's a no. Yeah. Can we have a round of applause? for yeah, Apollo's Jim Zelsa. Jim, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And thank you to all of you for joining a special edition of Bloomberg Surveillance live from the City of London. Subscribe to the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live every weekday starting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can watch us live on Bloomberg Television and always on the Bloomberg Terminal. Thanks for listening. I'm Tom Keen, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.